Welcome to everybody. I'm Jeff Gedman. I know many, maybe most of you. This is a privilege this next hour. We'll work an hour. We have a hard stop at 1 p.m. Eastern, and it's a wonderful group, and we will get as many of you into the conversation as we can. Our guest of honor is Natalie Uresco, whom many of you know personally. She is, in my words, a powerhouse. She grew up in the United States. She's lived and worked in Ukraine, including as finance minister. She studied at Harvard. She's written prolifically. She has deep, deep knowledge of the country, of the economic situation, and of course follows the war daily and hourly and is connected in very important ways. Natalie, welcome. Thank you. you joined us as part of an American Purpose Zoom discussion two weeks ago when we hosted Alex Gonchenko, a member of parliament representing Odessa. You were an important part of that conversation. Thank you. We'd like to host you again, even more properly live in early 2023. But meanwhile, we have you by Zoom. Uh, you and I agreed that this would be maximally interactive. We have so many people interesting influential and relevant people in the gallery. And you and I agreed that I could ask you a first question. And my question goes like this. Natalie, it seems to me that, that we have ample coverage in the United States and across Europe and other parts of the world on the state of the Russian military, battlefield failures, low morale, uh, inadequate tactics and changes in commanders uh, time and again. Uh, but perhaps we have inadequate uh, coverage on what this war meanwhile is doing to Ukraine, its infrastructure and economy. The costs are immense in economic and in human terms. And if I could start there and if you could tell us a little bit about what's happening right now in your view and how to understand the situation on the ground. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here amongst all of you. I, I agree, we need to focus in a little bit more deeply on the economic uh, devastation that's occurring. Of course, uh, the humanitarian uh, crisis, the humanitarian effects of this war are number one in all of our minds. But the Russian military right now has lost on the battleground in many places. And where I believe they are focusing is on the destruction of the economy, first and foremost right now. And they're doing that by targeting civilian infrastructure. Today, again, 35 kamikaze drones, 30 of which were uh, blocked, but five hit, each one creating enormous damage to the electricity, heating, and water systems. And probably most importantly, with the lack of consistent electricity, the economy suffers extraordinarily. From the beginning, I believe Russia has targeted key sectors of the Ukrainian economy to take out the capacity of Ukraine to exist as a sovereign state, starting with agriculture, the blockage of the ports, the inability to get the grain out, but not only blocking the ports, burning fields, burning grain silos, destroying the storage structures, even going so far as to allegedly kill one of the primary agricultural sector business people who was planning and, and strategizing on getting uh, rail transport for export in the situation. And second, the energy sector. From the beginning, they have targeted transmission lines, uh, power stations. Uh, they've taken the nuclear power station in Zaporizhia hostage. They're using that as a, a form of blackmail and denying energy uh, is something that they understand fully well will not only affect the economy, but will affect the number of refugees. The, during Doing this during the middle of winter like this is causing many people to rethink their decision to stay in Ukraine and those who've come back, whether or not they can stay with their children, uh, with their families in Ukraine through a cold winter. So I think that this is as much a war of the military as a war on the economy. The government's done a great job showing its resilience and trying to continue to provide basic services, paying pensions, paying salaries to the social sector, teachers, 
medical workers. But that's only been possible uh, to the extent that the West helps finance the budget deficit. And that budget deficit has been anywhere between three and $5 billion per month. When the monies from the West come late, the government is sought to pay the salaries on time and pensions on time anyway, meaning they print money and we're seeing inflation growing. It's over 20, 25% now, and it will continue to grow if the Western governments and the alliance of support that's been built don't come up with timely, reliable, uh, predictable support for the social part of the, of the budget. Uh, and as that proceeds and becomes more and more expensive over time, as this economy is destroyed, I think the Russians are counting on our alliance falling apart, our, our support for this financial distress uh, falling apart during 2023. So I think we need to talk more about it. I think we need to focus on it. And I think we need to build better support for it. So Natalie, um, from where you just left off better support for it, if you just take one piece, the winter, and <clears throat> three or four months. What are we, the West, we, the United States providing, and what can we still, with speed, provide to help Ukraine protect itself during this critical period? So what the US government is doing, uh, Tony Blinken, Secretary Blinken has announced a package in the range of something like 50, 60 million dollars of energy support. And that's primarily spare parts there. The U.S. government is searching globally right now for the type of equipment that would be needed to replace Ukrainian transformers. It's Soviet built equipment. It's not stuff that we have in stock in our backyard. It's not stuff that we can manufacture quickly. And so there is a search going on globally for the spare parts to be able to fix the Soviet systems. I think that uh, privately, there are multiple ways to help support with generators and power banks. Every major uh, foundation is now providing that kind of support. So First Lady Zelenska's foundation is providing it for family type orphanages. Uh, the president's U24 foundation is providing it for the medical sector. As you know, they're doing surgery now by candlelight uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and every organization in between has kind of sought out a way to help with that kind of emergency support to get through the winter. But if this, if the, the number one element I think of saving Ukrainians for the winter is providing them with the air defense to knock out not 80 or 85% of those drones, but 95 to 100%. Because the fact of the matter is we will not be able to find enough of this Soviet replacement equipment fast enough. We will not be able to get it to Kiev fast enough. Uh, if we keep allowing these attacks to continue. So number one on the list is probably air defense. Uh, the Patriots will help once the Patriots are in, in place, but it's a big country with a large territory to protect and every gaping hole uh, creates more damage. So I'm gonna ask you one more, Natalie, before we open it up. And that is you alluded to this in your introductory remark about people who decide to stay at home and people who decide to leave. And it's surely the case that it's important to limit the number of attacks and kamikaze drones. But as long as theoretically a small number can get through, it affects the way people live and manage their family and their daily affairs. Uh, could you speculate for us what you imagine the next 90 days or so to look like in terms of new refugee flows out of the country and to Western Europe or Central Europe? So I think it depends on how often these attacks continue. This morning, there was news from Ukraine that the Iranians had provided an incremental 250 Shaheen drones, uh, which means that you know this could continue for that next two or three months uh, actively. Ukrainians are very resilient. So you know I'm the chairperson of Aspen Institute Kiev, we had our annual uh, event, I was not there, but an annual event on Friday night uh, with no electricity, no heat, by candlelight and flashlight. Over 200 people arrived to sit together, to eat together, um, and to uh, build support for one another. Um, stories you will hear people blow dry their hair by the heaters on their car because they have no electricity. Uh, you bring tents into your home, into your, your, your living room, you live with you know, tent equipment, kerosene, uh, food equipment. So I think, you know, if, if 
Ukrainians are able to restore the electricity as they have thus far, with it not being out for more than a couple days, then the refugee situation won't increase dramatically. If they run out of spare parts, and, or if this increases and they, they're not able to uh, restore electricity and heat, heat, then I think you're looking at two to three million more refugees potentially into Europe um, in the next 90 days. And I think that is part of the warfare that Putin is attempting. He's attempting to scare uh, the Europeans, try to try to try to break up uh, this alliance, which has been so strong thus far. I think he's made making a mistake. Neither Ukrainians are reacting to this brutal terrorism by giving up, nor do I see the cracks in the alliance as a result. But that's certainly his 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 goal, his objective. So thank you. Um, I'm going to add that, Natalie. We're um, we American Purpose in early 2023 are doing a series of public events with the Washington D.C. public libraries on a range of topics. We're going to start with Ukraine. We had a meeting uh, last week with uh, staff of one of the library branches, uh, where there was uh, a gentleman in his 40s, a young African American staffer, an Asian American. And they said to me, well, we don't do foreign policy. and We've never been to Ukraine, but can we pose the question, how is it that trains are still functioning in Ukraine? By which we mean this country has a resilience and a cohesion <laughs> that we respect and we're so intensely curious about and to learn from. I mentioned that as a related aside. So with that, we're gonna open the floor if in each case, many of you are friends with Natalie, some of you have met her, but if you would identify yourself for the sake of the gallery, and Michelle, when I fail to see somebody and the raised hand function, would you bring that person to my attention? Who would like to be first? Uh, Giselle Donnelly, is that you? You have the uh floor. It is I. Somebody had to go first. Uh, to crack I suppose we have uh, Natalie on our podcast tomorrow. So uh, uh, this is a warm-up. I'll say who you are and what is the oh, podcast. Um, uh, uh, I am Giselle Donnelly. I work at the American Enterprise Institute. And uh, joining us here in the uh, peanut gallery uh, are my co-hosts for the Eastern Front uh, podcast, uh, uh, Yulia Jojo and Dalibor Ruhaj. So, uh, uh, you know, we're all rehearsing for tomorrow. But Natalie, I, I wanted to ask about the, the sort of uh, intersection of uh, these attacks on civilian inter infrastructure and the resurgence of uh, the theory, the sort of Kissingerian theory of Russian inevitable victory. Um, which was definitely um, looking worse for wear uh, by the end of the uh, Kherson offensive and, you know, in the fall and so on and so forth. But it, it's notable that then there's been a resurgence as the uh, uh, drone attacks and missile attacks on, on cities and infrastructure um, have picked up over the last month or so. How worried are you about sort of the uh, grand strategic effect of of this? I think I intimated it earlier. I, I'm not. Um, so Kissinger's uh, approach was unacceptable to Ukrainians from day one, and it becomes with each day more and more unacceptable. I, I, think, I think if you speak to people on the ground in Ukraine, uh, their defiance grows with each attack rather than dissipates. They're not being exhausted. They're not being forced into a corner. They're becoming stronger in their defiance. And I think that thus far, the United States and the Allies have respected that this is Ukraine's war and Ukraine needs to decide when it is to uh, time to sit down and talk. I, I think, you know, you, you've, you've heard uh, from the U.S. intelligence uh, agencies and folks that they don't believe even Putin's ready to sit down and talk. And today's meetings in Belarus um, between Lukashenko and Putin, I think will raise the specter again of uh, what uh, Commander Chief Zaluzhny talked about in his interview in Economist as, a, as an attack from the North coming in the, in the first quarter of next year. I don't, I don't believe 
there is a serious attempt to force Ukraine into some type of position which it, it, it doesn't wish to have upon itself. I think obviously leverage is there. You can't ignore the leverage. They're both financial support and military. But I, I think everyone is probably, or I hope everyone understands that any leader of Ukraine who chose to, quote, compromise at this point uh, would have zero uh, support from the population. You know, the most recent uh, polls in Ukraine show that 90 something percent of people believe they can continue, they can win this war. Over 80 percent believe the country's on the right path. And that's after these drone attacks. Uh, again, you, you could force a leader into making a decision. You couldn't force the country. And I think I think the Western allies understand that. And I, I don't think that that pressure is very real right now. I think there's just a there's a magic to the language of being ready for diplomacy, acknowledging that diplomacy has a role to play and when it has to happen. And so I think that's where, you know, everyone, I, I think the Ukrainians have had to convince the West that they are ready for diplomacy. It's just that they don't believe that the, now is the time. And then the second part is what would that diplomacy, what would be the objective of the diplomacy? It's not a ceasefire. It's an end, it's a durable peace to the war. And so I, it's, it's, I think, important to kind of identify where the pieces of the puzzle are. We often talk, you know, Ukrainians are not willing to, to talk. They're willing to talk. They're willing to talk about a durable peace and security with territorial sovereignty and integ territorial integrity and sovereignty. They're not willing to talk about compromise right now. But I think the pressure is not on in a big way. So thank you, Kazala and Natalie. Uh, Bill Galston, and then forgive me if I get the order a little bit wrong, but you all get in, don't worry. Yulia, Christian, and Rem. But Bill, you have the floor. Well, first of all, thanks so much, Yo, know, for sharing your time with us. Uh, <laughs> I can only imagine how busy you are given the current situation. Look, a back of the envelope calculation uh, suggests that in military terms, Ukraine will need. Uh, between 50 and 100 billion dollars next year. And the figures that you've just provided us on the economic front uh, suggest that 60 billion dollars in economic assistance, 5 billion a month, would be a reasonable estimate. And the, and the, the inflation figures that you've provided, uh, I think, demonstrate that the economic aid that Ukraine is now receiving is not sufficient to close the gap. Otherwise, they wouldn't be printing money and contributing to you know, what could turn into a hyperinflation if, we're, if the government is not careful and, and if we don't do our part. So all of that is a prelude to my, my question. Uh, what, are, what are the mechanisms and conversations among the Western allies that need to take place quickly in order to get economic aid to Ukraine up to where it needs to be. I ask because I don't think that the United States will be willing to pay 100% or anything close to that on the economic side. And so European countries are going to have to provide more cash on the barrelhead than they have so far. How's that going to happen? So first, I want to clarify, I think that Ukraine's been forced to print because of the unreliability of the timing of the Western finance. Mm -hmm. In other words, the EU made promises and the EU didn't deliver on time and wages have to be paid. You know, you get up in the morning as a finance minister in Ukraine and you know you have to pay wages and there's nothing in the treasury. Um, you can't say to everyone, you know what, we'll pay your wages in two months when the EU gets together. The US was very timely in its support in 2022. I think um, it's not... So it's not as much a gap as it was a timing issue in 2022. There was sufficient, I think, support. It just was there. There, it, it was not timely. I think as we look forward to 2023, that they've reduced the budget deficit by trying to reduce costs um, to three billion a month. Uh, the EU has already approved, as of last week, their half of that, 18 billion euro. The U.S. has it in legislation right now, sitting before Congress as we go through our budget antics. Um, so I think 36, 40 billion is pretty much in the bank, I would argue, mm -hmm. for 2023. But I do believe that's a minimum. And so if things continue to get worse, 
Uh, you have to add to that what we call kind of urgent reconstruction, not Marshall Plan, not, but you know, just putting the electricity back on. And that's another 17, 18 billion dollars. Uh, I think that uh, there hasn't been enough focus on this in a coordinated fashion, but last week or a few days ago, there was a meeting in Paris, a G7 meeting in Paris led by the French, and they agreed to establish a coordination platform for the financial side for the oh. first time. Something I think is going to be like the Ramstein process for the military. So I think it's going to be a loose coordination for now. They have uh, established that they would, their objective was to send each government would send a representative, uh, identify a representative by January, and maybe even hold their first meeting by January. So you'd have kind of like a financial Ramstein to make sure that it's being coordinated. In addition to that, um, the World Bank is more and more becoming de, de facto the coordinator because monies are going through a World Bank trust fund. Um, so the Americans have surprisingly put their monies through this trust fund. Uh, the Europeans have not. But I think um, the World Bank is the one kind of that's that's doing the, the reporting and the monitoring on the use of the budgetary funds to make sure that, you know, the Ukrainians are spending on civilian, not military, that it's going to pensions, that it's going to the things that they claim it's going. So the World Bank is already performing in some way on the fiscal, on the macro side, a little bit of a coordination role. I think the entity that's not doing enough is the world is the IMF. <clears throat> and there are two pieces to that. One, they're not providing sufficient financial support because Ukraine is not currently in a program. And IMF doesn't have a program that fits for a country who's actively at war. Uh, so they're doing some kind of macro policy review program that doesn't come with any money. It's meant to support uh, the other donors and provide them with confidence that they're anchored, that Ukraine is anchored in a macro fiscal policy that makes sense. Um, but it's not providing any new monies. And I think where we're going to go through as we enter into 2023 is there's going to be more pressure put on the IMF to come up with something out of the box, something like they did on COVID that was out of the box. Uh, it might have some conditionality, but not traditional program conditionality. Um, and they're going to have to do a bigger piece of the puzzle. But no, the U.S. will not provide 100%. Right now, it's about 50-50 with the EU on the fiscal part. Uh, and the EU has started to step up. I just think mm -hmm. the, the problem with the EU is predictability, timeliness and predictability. Well, thank you for that very detailed and informative answer. Thank you. So thank you, Bill. Um, I'm uh, looking at my list and reworking the order. Julia, I think you have something now pertaining to Bill's question. And if it's right, spot on, I give you the floor. And then we go to Mattia, who I, Mattia, hi to Berlin. And sorry, I lost you a little bit earlier. If you indulge me, we'll go to Julia and then you, and then we'll stick to the list. Is that okay? Thank you both. Julia, go ahead. Thank you, um, Julia Zoja, as uh, Giselle mentioned, a colleague of hers, and I run the Black Sea program and I teach European security at Georgetown and George Washington. Um, you mostly answered already my question, Atadi, but I was going to ask you um, if you can give us a little bit more detail on sort of what you expect in this political finance um, element. First of all, from what I understand so far, when it comes to financial aid to Ukraine, um, is it uh, uh, is it that the United States is providing grants and the EU is providing uh, loans? And does that matter in the long term? And then over the last two months, there's been at least more talk here in the United States. And so I expect pressure in, um, in the coming year that the um, EU uh, should lead on this, provide more aid um, because it is in their immediate interest while the United States continues to lead on military aid. And so with that in mind, is that a is that your assessment? Can you tell us a little bit about, about more about that and also delve maybe slightly into what you mean by unpredictability of the EU beyond the immediate um, uh, immediate needs of Ukraine? How much do you see pressure, political pressure from France and Germany, um, especially to um, to uh, push towards diplomacy when it is not wanted and perhaps even try to limit financial aid um, because of that in the coming year? Thank you. So first of all, 
Uh, debt versus grants. Yes, the United States has been amazing in providing grant funding about a billion and a half per month. And the EU has been doing uh, debt. Uh, I will say the EU debt is very low cost. And in the new package, the new 18 billion euro, they're actually paying the interest for the first, I think, 10 years. They're picking it up. So it's not financially critical today. Over time, Yes, um, with a 40-50% decline in GDP this year, Ukraine's GDP to debt ratio is going to become too high, and eventually a debt restructuring is going to be necessary. But I don't think we should worry about that today. The, it's such low-cost loans that right now, if that's the only way the EU can get it done quickly, I think that's fine. Uh, always grants are going to be preferred to debt, but eventually that'll end up in a Paris Club restructuring somewhere along the way. Um, I think I, I I don't agree that you know that, that the EU should do more. Uh, I know some people say that I think they should do their share, but I think this is as much in the U.S. interest. This what's happening is not a European problem, and I don't like to go down that road that this is your backyard; it's your problem. This is a global issue of democracy versus autocracy. This is a global issue of the uh, precedent for non-proliferation of of nuclear weapons. This is a global issue on the UN Charter and war crimes and genocide and, and crimes against humanity. This is a global issue. So I am not in favor of saying, you know, the Europeans need to take this over. Uh, you hear, you know, the US is providing the maximum military. You guys will end up doing the reconstruction. I think the Europeans like that. The Europeans want to be in charge of the reconstruction. Um, the EU put out a little uh, schematic where they would be uh, uh, at the top of the pyramid. Uh, the Americans won't agree with that from my perspective. Um, and the Europeans like that because it's going to be a major uh, support for the European business. And that's the reason why I think Americans need to stay involved, because American business needs to be involved. So I think there needs to be a balance. Um, I think the EU issue with stability of the decision making, one has to do with Hungary. And each time a decision has to be you know, unanimous and you have this stick in the mud um, that you know is able to stop things from happening, change the sanctions, uh, you know, to this day, Kirill of the Moscow Patriarchate Church is not sanctioned simply because of Hungary. And, you know, Hungary is not even an Orthodox country. So think about what that all means. Why is he, why is Hungary sticking up for the Russian Orthodox uh, Patriarch? Uh, he's sanctioned in the United States and in the UK. Um, I think so. I, it's been a timing issue, really. It's that they don't deliver on timing. It's their bureaucracy. It's that they deliver, but they deliver late and wages have to be paid on time. If you want to keep some semblance of governance in the country and of social services, you have to pay your salaries on time. Uh, I don't, you know, I think, you know, President Macron and the French have their approach and that, you know, their approach is one where they, you know, constantly want to be seen as at the, at the center of promoting dialogue and of finding a third way. I think the Germans are less right now. Uh, Chancellor Schultz has been more and more, I think, aligned with the US position and the UK position on, on Ukraine. With each day, I think it grows, in fact. Uh, and their military support has grown and their financial support has grown. And so what we were saying about Germany four months ago is really not true today. And so we really need to watch Germany because it changes and it's changing. And I think they've really stepped up. I, I don't think that they're going to blackmail Ukraine or limit financial aid in the next 12 months because of this. I think that the political support from the populations in Europe is so strong for Ukraine. And the and the pressure from Eastern Europe, I just came from Prague, the pressure from Eastern Europe and the Baltics is so very real uh, that it's very clear that Ukraine needs to defeat Russia militarily before you can enter into uh, any kind of talks. I, I don't think that they, I don't think that they could unilaterally uh, blackmail Ukraine in that way. I think the support for Ukraine is too strong. And I, I think, you know, if 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 we got to a point where all that was uh, was being discussed was Crimea, then you could see maybe some breakdowns across different uh, countries, across different perspectives. But we're not there yet, and so I don't I don't I think everyone is right now, uh, amazingly, uh, very very unified uh, behind behind Ukraine. The differences are, you know, when do you start talking and who starts the talks? And there, there's a lot of personalities and egos involved, but. I, I don't think it's it, we're at the point where they're going to use financial pressure or military pressure, aid pressure to 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 steer Ukraine away from what it's it's engaged in today, which is winning the war, defeating Russia. So thank you both for that. 
um, apropos changing Germany, there's a new poll out that has uh, a majority of supporters of the three parties in the governing coalition, the Social Democrats, Free Democrats, and the Greens, uh, supporting uh, heavier weapons to Ukraine and tanks, leopard tanks to Ukraine. I think it's 55% SPD, 70% Greens, the Free Democrats falling in between. Yulia, if you have that poll at hand, if you could put it in chat, that would be very helpful. So now I have Mattia Christian Rem. I have Alexander Dalibor, Larry House, David Miller. We get to all of you in the remaining 28 minutes, I promise. Mattia, you have the floor and please tell us a word about where you are, I know, and what you do. I know, but perhaps not everybody on this call. Yes, thank you for including me, Jeff. My name is Mattia Nellis. I, until the full-scale invasion, I was living in Ukraine, in fact, working for the German equivalent of USAD. Uh, on municipal to, um, on community development in eastern Ukraine, but I, now I joined the parliament to work as a foreign policy advisor of the Green Party. In fact, so thank you, Natalie, for um, for really uh, making the point about Germany and uh, a nuanced point because often uh, we we found the discussion in Ukraine being black and white and Germany more painted as black. So. Um, and I want to say that the mood has is still, as you as you rightfully said, Natalie, it's really the support for Ukraine remains very strong in Germany. So you you see it in the most recent polls from early December that the majority of Germans, like more than three quarter, two thirds, um, are willing to um, increase or keep the high levels of support despite higher economic costs for themselves. So Putin has, in a way, not just underestimated the Ukrainians, but he's also underestimated our. Western German resolve to keep supporting Ukraine, but nevertheless he's trying to buy himself time. So you outlined the economic uh, way to, throughout 2023, and he's tr tr now trading body bags for time. So I wanted to ask you: you already outlined the, you know, Kissinger. Uh, we we are all against the argument of Kissinger that compromise can be found, but uh, Secretary of State Blinken recently outlined the U.S. objective. Um, in restoring the February 24 lines or as a U.S. goal, for which from my perspective and even from a green perspective is questionable because these lines right now, they're fictitious. If Ukraine reaches them on the battlefield, why would, why would they sh or should they stop there? So I wanted to ask you about kind of the U.S. view on the, on the goals because we've been vague. Ukraine victory was the goal, yeah. But now for the first time in weeks, we heard something specific, the February 24 lines, which I personally view as insufficient. So maybe you can elaborate how the theory of Ukrainian victory is evolving in, in, in DC. I, I think it varies by agency and by moment, to be perfectly honest with you. I, I think that there is a, you know, a, a general agreement that Ukraine must win. Uh, but there is no agreement on what Russia defeated looks like. And when you can't define Russia defeated, that's when all of this starts to kind of uh, be complicated on the U.S. side. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't believe that what Blinken meant was that Ukraine should stop at the February 24th. You know, I think, you know, that's kind of a minimalist goal. Um, but you've also, you've also seen American announcements that they even acknowledge that Ukraine can reach uh, Russian targets within Russia that are uh, def defensive, in essence, taking out uh, areas where the where the cruise missiles are coming from. They've also acknowledged that Ukraine has the right to attempt to take Crimea back. So there are a variety of statements from a variety of players, and I think they're not they're not all unified. And I think they're not unified because I don't believe anyone in the U.S. government really has a handle on what is an acceptable definition for Russian defeat. And I think that's got to be worked out, but I don't think it has to be worked out today. I think really what today needs to focus on is getting Ukraine more military support now to minimize the human and, and, and the physical um, devastation. Because you, you, you know, if, if we dole it out slowly, as we become more comfortable in the West with giving them HIMARS and we became more comfortable with Patriots, eventually we'll become comfortable with MiGs. Um, you know, too, too much is happening in the interim, too much damage, too much destruction, too much loss of life. And uh, I think that this is where Jeff started. It's going to cost us all that much more later uh, and cost Ukraine all that much more to rebuild. And a durable peace is only possible with a strong Ukraine. It's not just defeat at a moment in time, right? 
you have an imperialistic revanchist kind of Russia, which could continue to be like that for hundreds of years. Uh, it, you know, you're, you, you need to build a Ukraine. Ukraine needs to build itself to be a durable country, a country with a with a durable with a with a with a military, with an economy that's functional, with you know the anti-corruption uh, rule of law issues all resolved. Uh, uh, hopefully, a member of of the European Union. I think EU accession is critical to solving the problem. I think the fact that Ukraine wasn't brought into EU earlier is part of the problem, um, and it's part of the solution. So I think. You know, I think what we need to focus on is winning, at least on the battlefield right now, minimizing the destruction and devastation, defending the, the, the air, uh, you know, covering the skies, as the Ukrainians say, uh, to minimize the destruction uh, and doing it urgently so that uh, Putin doesn't get a breather uh, to rebuild, to restock, to retool and to rethink. Um, I think at that point, you know, the leverage that the West has will be used when they when, when it gets to that point. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure in the corridors of power, you know, decisions being made on the spot. But I think Crimea is the weak point in the argument for the West. I don't agree with that. To be very clear, I'm not pro promoting that. It's not. I, I believe that you know we need to stick with international law and with you know inviolability of borders because I believe that principle is critically important globally. Um, but I think that that is something that uh, I see weakness across the globe. So, Mattia, thank you very much for that. Thanks for joining today. Let's try now doubling up a little bit to push us along as time begins to raise. Could I please take Christian and Rem together and Christian, you first, please. Hans Seidel Foundation. I'm, he, I'm based here in uh, DC, but the uh, foundation, Hans Seidel Foundation, is headquartered in Munich. Um, first, a quick comment on the German government. Yeah, of course, we uh, appreciate yeah, all the uh, uh, you know, changing yeah, positions of the German government. Yeah. We as opposition, CDU, CSU, want to keep up pressure on the German government yeah, not to uh, soften yeah, the military support, yeah, really to uh, fully back Ukraine. Back to the uh, financial uh, mechanism. Yeah. Natalie, do you have any um, overall uh, estimate yeah, on the reconstruction uh, funding needs yeah, for, uh, for the entire reconstruction, not only for next year? And then reconstruction, uh, will it be accompanied by governance reforms uh, within Ukraine? Because this has always been like a, an issue, yeah, weak governance yeah, within uh, the, the Ukrainian government, yeah, corruption and whatever. Uh, third, um, any ideas on how to make Russia accountable, yeah, how to hold Russia accountable yeah, by, uh, with all the damage yeah, uh, the, uh, the, this brutal aggression and unprovoked war has, has, has caused? Yeah? And, 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 and the third thought, yeah, would it be a chance for Ukraine yeah, reconstruction to modernize yeah, the, uh, the country? So is, is there something good in, in we, we can see in, in all this damage happening? So, so Natalie, hold on that just for one moment. Thank you, Christian. I know that's a full question posed, but Rem, could we get you in right now, please? Hello, my name is uh, Rim Gilfanov. I am a director of Tatar Service of Radio Free Europe from Prague. And thank you so much, Ms. Yaretsko, for your uh, wonderful explanation and briefing on the uh, situation around Ukraine. Uh, my question mostly, I think about mostly about politics, not economics, uh, maybe even geopolitics. Uh, economic reconstruction of Ukraine uh, is not possible without safeguarding country's security and real independence, first of all, which means uh, what should the world to do uh, with the aggressor? So it stops endangering not only Ukraine, but uh, all its neighbors. Recently, we've been witnessing, uh, with the help of Ukrainian uh, diplomacy as well, by the way, blast of ideas, initiatives, international gatherings on the decolonizing Russia, it's full denuclearization, generally total reconstruction of that huge space, which now like uh, serves as a source of uh, danger for everybody. How far the world can go in this direction and how do you see Russia's future? Well, there are like two full podcast questions, both of them. On reconstruction, quickly, let's see. Uh, Kiev School of Economics uh, and the World Bank have both done some really good uh, 
uh, estimates of damages. They're in the 500, 600 billion dollar range, but that's before all of this electricity uh, infrastructure went down. My my view has always been when this war started, not that I knew exactly how it would end, but I know what destruction is possible, that you were going to be looking at a trillion dollars worth of, of damage. And, and I say that because I sat in Puerto Rico uh, for the last five years and one day hurricane damage on an island 100 miles wide, which is 1 60th the size of Ukraine, was $80 billion, ADO. So I think um, <clears throat> there are many estimates on the damage, but they're all heading upwards towards a trillion, 500, 600. Um, you know, by the time this is over, since we don't know when this is over, um, I, I'm pretty sure we're gonna get there. I think the uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful German Marshall Fund um, piece out there. There's a recent CEPA uh, piece out there. On, on reconstruction and important to look at what the Ukrainians have put out in terms of their plans and their vision. Of, they put it out at the Lugano conference. That plan, that vision includes many government reforms. It includes modernization. It is a leapfrogging. It's kind of uh, three paths, I would call it. Um, you know, one is kind of to rebuild, renew. One is to be on the EU accession and, and everything that has to do with, you know, modernizing at an EU level. And the third is green and digitally uh, capable and, and, and promoting and moving technologically leapfrogging, which Ukraine has already done in the banking sector. It's already done uh, in government services and many government services with uh, different platforms. Uh, so I think it is a great opportunity to, to, to build back better, which we're not supposed to say because uh, that's politics. So I'll call it renew uh, the economy. How does it get financed? Well, first, I think we should we should tap into those Russian monies that you mentioned, in particular the central bank reserve monies that have been frozen over three hundred billion, the largest amount sitting in Germany, in fact, uh, over ninety billion. I think that there are multiple academic studies as to how you could accomplish this based on UN resolutions that have already been adopted and uh, UN uh, uh, decision making. Um, I think we should start that process now um, and use it to rebuild the electricity sector, perhaps use it as leverage to have them stop bombing the electricity sector and, and say, we'll use it as long as you keep destroying the civilian infrastructure, we'll stop when you stop. Um, but I think uh, that that is one way to hopefully build in some accountability. Obviously, for war crimes, there's a whole nother path, which you know is going to take forever and may or may not promote accountability. But I think I think supporting Ukraine to win this war is the number one way to promote accountability, to prove that you cannot use brute force. We have to not allow them to use brute force to break us down. So in my mind, if we begin to walk down a path of compromise, if we begin to walk down a path of trying to push Ukraine towards compromise, we've lost any argument on accountability because we have ourselves said that uh, that compromise is possible and you can use brute force to accomplish your goals, even if that objective is Crimea alone or Crimea and Donbass alone. So um, I think reconstruction is gonna be an incredible opportunity, not just for governments uh, to support, uh, not only Russian money to support, but the private sector to support. And for that to really come true, those anti-corruption reforms, that rule of law, that EU accession process has to really enable um, Ukraine to, to move away from reinventing the wheel, which we've been doing for 30 some years, and instead just take the path of EU accession, EU membership, and EU rules. On Russia, Rim, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a rare Ukrainian who will say, I don't wanna talk about what, what Russia looks like, and I'm not gonna promote Russia's um, collapsing into, or, you know, Federation collapsing. I'm gonna stick with my argument that um, borders are inviolable. And uh, I'm gonna do that because I believe it's critical for us to keep our support. And I'm, I, I, I don't believe that it's good for, as a, I'm a Ukrainian and an American, I wear two hats. Um, I don't believe it's good for us to argue that Russia should collapse while at the same time, they're suggesting Ukraine's border should collapse. And then we get into which borders are more uh, inviolable, which are less inviolable. So I, I just think that what happens in Russia will happen. And, you know, everyone, there are scenarios. I've seen great some scenario planning. I, I just, I believe that um, it's not for me to say um, how Russia lasts or doesn't last through this. And I think it's really important not to start talking about just deconstructing Russia while we don't want our country to be deconstructed. And so if borders are inviolable, we should not be arguing that they are different for, um, for Russia. So I, 
I don't know what Russia's future holds. I don't know that anyone can predict it. I think it's a it's a it's a it's a very unpredictable environment, um, one without a succession pattern, one without uh, a civil society uh, to influence, one without an opposition, one without media, and I think things could potentially get worse before they get better in Russia. Um, but I I don't think we need unlike the Kissinger proposal, I don't believe we need to define what happens in Russia to understand that the number one issue is winning um, and beating this tyranny and this terror and stopping it from happening. And I think, you know, what happens in Russia happens. Kind of like the, you know, I was in the US government when the Soviet Union collapsed and everyone was terrified what it meant, what it meant. Well, it didn't mean what they thought it meant. It collapsed, Never, you know, it, it, it happened and we went on. So I think we just need to move forward. So Natalie, thank you. Uh, Rem, if you can still hear me, you and your colleagues have published a short book on <clears throat> voices of Russian descent. Could you say a very, very brief word about that book? Yeah, <clears throat> very briefly. I mean, actually, you know, it's, it's all about these uh, current discussions about good Russians, bad Russians. I mean, the world is tending to think of, that uh, Russia is like, like a murder, you know, the, the, the main source for endangering all the world stability, which is partly the right thing. But at the same time, it gets to the uh, such uh, excesses like uh, everybody <clears throat> tries to uh, accuse any, any Russian uh, without any understanding that the Russia is different as well. I mean, there are so many uh, ethnic minorities over there who were uh, repressed, uh, oppressed for decades, for centuries. And they are in this position uh, for for quite a long time. So we decided, given this, uh, just to collect the those uh, brave cases uh, in Russia of the people who, despite all these uh, repressions, decided to show to show their opposition to the war. So we collected the stories uh, of Russians meaning not only ethnically Russians, but I mean, Russian citizens, let's put it this way, uh, who uh, protested on the streets uh, and the, uh, at the schools, who, whose students actually snitched uh, those people to, to face bed to Russian police. So they suffered. And uh, it was really nice book actually uh, came out and uh, and just to illustrate it, how uh, actually it's it's a good, good uh, action with this book. Uh, last uh, last week, actually, we had a meeting at Charles University here in Prague with the students of the, who study Russian and Eastern European studies, and uh, they came to the meeting actually very well prepared in, in sense that we they were actually. First, those who are accusing, I mean, Russia's, uh, Russian people uh, are guilty of everything. But then we, they left the meeting with a sense like they got some interesting insight about the uh, complicated things, processes going on inside the Russian society. So the book is, uh, I think I send it to Jeffrey and it's possible on electronic version as well. I can, can give uh, the details later. So Rem, thank, thank you for that. So here we are, you all, we have 10 minutes left. I'm gonna call on Alexander and Dalibor pairing those two, Larry and David pairing those two. If each of you could keep your question or comment to one minute or less, we'll have a chance for an adequate reply and we'll end on time. Alexander, welcome. Hi. From Prague, and thank you. I'm director of the Belarus Service of Radio Free Europe, and I can report that Putin and Lukashenko started their talks two hours ago. Putin was late, as always, and they declared that they're talking mainly about economy, but the priority is military cooperation, so go figure. Uh, 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 did, uh, did you see, I, I have a simple question about corruption. Uh, what is this war doing to corruption in Ukraine? Is it exposing it, enhancing it, stopped it? Thank you. So, and Natalie, uh, I think Dalibor has withdrawn his question. Dalibor, you're welcome to jump in if you like toward the end, but Natalie, you have the floor. microphone back to you. 
just very quickly, I think it's reduced it. I think that when you see people um, and you talk to them, there's there's a sense of common uh, goals, common unity. Uh, this devastation is so extraordinary that people are are, you know, if, if they were to find out that you were stealing from the from the from the from the hands from the jaws of those who are uh, defending the country, it would be quite amazing. It's not eliminated. You, you can't eliminate it. Um, but I think there's less corruption right now than there is typically normally. Thank you, Larry Haas. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Natalie, uh, nice to see you. I saw you the other night uh, in person. Um, and I wanted to ask a question in the spirit of that conversation and something you said today. Um, uh, we had a long discussion, a bunch of us, about getting over the fear of what might come next in Russia, uh, you know, akin uh, to what happened with regards to the Soviet Union. So that's one premise. The second premise is the stakes that you say that are at, uh, everything at stake geopolitically, and not just with regard to tyranny in Russia, but with regard to tyranny around the world, China, uh, Iran, all everyone who's watching. In that spirit and with all the appropriate caveats, I wanted to ask you on the military side, is there anything that the West is doing to unduly restrict or not adequately facilitate the ability of Ukraine to take the fight to Russia, number one. And number two, is there anything that the West or anyone else can do to interfere with the delivery of drones from Iran to Russia? I'm not a military expert, so I really can't answer that question. I, I, I can say that, you know, I think that we have interfered and unduly restricted Ukraine by not providing it sufficient uh, weaponry, what they've asked for, when they asked for it. We took too long to get to the level of confidence that we have today, and we tend to take too long to get to the next level of confidence uh, that, that's required for tomorrow. So we don't have the long range, you know, high Mars, we have the shorter range high Mars. So yes, it's unduly restricting Ukraine. Why? Is it a confidence issue? Is it a training issue? Is it a combination? Is it, is it fear of Russia? It's, it's probably a little of all of that, and it changes too slowly. Um, I'm glad we're getting patriots, but had we had patriots four months ago, you know, this war would have been much different. Uh, the level of killing and devastation would have been much different. <laughs> Anything the West can do on Iranian drones? Don't know the answer to that. I don't see an option. You know, the Ukrainians are, have targeted, or I shouldn't say that, I should say. There's rumor that uh, the, the Ukrainians have targeted Iranian instructors in Crimea and had hit them. Um, and that some some had perished in in a, in, in a battle, but I don't know for, for certain. And I and I'm sure that that's you know that's the only thing that's being discussed at this point is when they get into Ukrainian territory. <clears throat> thank you. So thank you both, David Miller. You've waited patiently. You have the floor. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you for um, coming and giving this talk. <clears throat> I am a uh, former U.S. Marine, now currently a senior at Harvard studying government. Uh, building on the discussions of reconstruction and reforms, I was curious, what can Western governments actually do to help pressure Ukraine into implementing these plans for reform that they have once the war is over? You had mentioned uh, offering EU membership, which I agree that sounds phenomenal, but could things like making partial loans or partial reconstruction aid like contingent on these reforms help pressure Ukraine? Or do you think something like that could just backfire? And then uh, finally, how could graduating government students such as myself actually get involved in helping Ukraine if you have any ideas? So, yeah, I, I'm not in favor of tying and conditioning all the reconstruction money to reforms. There's, you know, if you think about when we have um, emergencies in the United States, FEMA related, you know, I lived through Puerto Rico, you have category A, B, and then you have C through G. So there's an urgent reconstruction category A, B that has to have to do with kind of life and limb and demining the country is going to be number one on this list because they've mined a third of the territory, 200,000 square uh, kilometers. So, you know, I think we should not be conditioning that. I, I think there will be, in addition to reconstruction, a, a fiscal macro lifeline that's going to be necessary. And the IMF will be there and the IMF money will be conditioned. <laughs> it always is conditioned, it will be conditioned, and it should continue to be conditioned. And then the third path is the EU accession. And you, Ukraine is more desirous of this than ever. And that's where the conditions should be on rule of law. To me, 
every party should play its part, but you don't need to, you don't need to have overlapping conditions because it creates, when I was in government in 14, I saw one of the comments, it creates so much confusion when, you know, the World Bank, the IMF and the US government are conditioning their in incremental streams on anti-corruption, but differently. And then you have to have them negotiate amongst themselves. You have to negotiate with them. It's impossible. So I, I think it needs to be well coordinated. And each party has a, a role to play. The IMF on, um, you know, state-owned enterprise governance, macro, independence of the central bank, uh, the EU on rule of law, on trade, on, 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 on court issues. And then, you know, I think the reconstruction needs to go forward again to a large degree. If it's private sector financed it'll require those things to have already been put in place because the private sector is going to have to have the confidence to go into that marketplace. So what can you do? I think there's going to be an immense set of opportunities for people with your skill sets um, and, and others uh, in the rebuilding. And so I think you need to just stay tuned to all the different think tanks that are doing work. Um, I think you need to stay attuned to all the companies that are going to be trying to bid on this business. Uh, everything from consulting firms to uh, uh, construction firms. I think it's it's going to be a, a big boon uh, when when it when it happens. But I think we need to get there first. So right now, I'd say you know as much activity as possible to minimize the devastation and destruction is what we all need to focus on, and then humanitarian support to get through this winter. David, thank you. Uh, to wrap us up here, <clears throat> allow me to make three very quick points of advertisement. Uh, Read American Purpose are deeply committed to the cause of Ukraine. We're doing a project now, an ongoing series of roundtables, including in Berlin, with a New York-based group called Renew Democracy Initiative. Its executive director, Uriel, was with us earlier in this conversation. Perhaps he's still there and I don't see him. Uriel, his chairman, Gary Kasparov, and I were in Florida last week speaking with people about Ukraine. Thanks to Bonnie McElveen Hunter and Hi Wilbur, you're with us and you were part of that conversation last week Great to see you. Second point, Eastern Front. It's an AEI podcast co-hosted by Giselle Donnelly, Dalai Barohaj, Yulia Shosha. So tomorrow, featuring you, Natalie. So we'll send around when that is issued and published. And third, thanks to Frank Fukuyama, co-founder and chairman of the editorial board of American Purpose, and everybody else in this call who's writing in a number of places about Ukraine, including for American Purpose. Natalie, that was splendid. That is good as an hour gets. You're fighting a cold. You're fighting a very demanding schedule. It was generous of you to take this time. And then come January, we'll host you in person. Great to see you all. Join me in thanking Natalie. Great conversation. Deeply appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy New Year. Mm -hmm.